So good afternoon and welcome. I'm Joe White. I'm the director of the Center for Policy Studies here at Case Western Reserve University. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this Global Currents Lecture um, about the democracy establishment. The Global Currents Lectures are sponsored by a grant from Ms. Eloise Briskin, and we are very grateful to her for her support. Um, today's topic uh, is something that I think, I think you could have, you know, 40 or 50 years ago, you, could have, you wouldn't have talked about a democracy establishment. This is you know, a relatively recent development in international affairs. Uh, there might have been efforts to spread democracy, but there wasn't a whole non-governmental organization world of democracy spreaders. Um, and therefore, it's an, a very interesting thing to, to research and see, how, and see how it has developed over time. Um, I could make a bunch of comments about how that developed, but you, you, we have a speaker here to talk about it who knows much more than I do, and that's the idea of bringing people to campus. So I'd just like to say a few things about the speaker, uh, about our speaker. Sarah Bush uh, graduated from Princeton with a PhD uh, in political science, in, or in politics, I guess, sorry, in politics, not in political science, uh, in 2011. She spent a year at the Belfer Center for International Affairs doing a postdoc at Harvard, and then joined the faculty at Temple University. Uh, she had an undergraduate degree at Northwestern. Um, she, you will learn more about her research here, but I can say from the day that she has spent here that she is a very thoughtful and insightful scholar, and I look forward uh, to, to hearing what she has to say. I should say one other thing, though, which is that um, if, if you picked up at the back uh, the, car, the flyer about her book, uh, it, it looks like a very nice book. Um, she is experiencing the young, some of the young scholar experiences here, which include discovering that publishers are not particularly timely. <laughs> <laughs> the topic is timely, but the, 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 the publisher, so we had actually, when we, when, so if you've read any of our announcements about this event, so uh, you know, a few months ago we were saying, coming out in February. And then one of them said, we'll be released on the day of the talk, because it was due for release on March 31st. And now we will say, uh, coming sometime in April, I believe. <laughs> uh, but the good news is, this way you get a preview of a coming attraction. So thank you very much, Professor. <laughs> OK. Thank you. So thank you so much for coming today, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share some of my research with all of you. I'm delighted to be in Ohio. I am going to try to keep an eye on the clock, so I'll speak for about 40 or 45 minutes, and then I'm really looking forward to your questions and comments at the end. So the title of my presentation, as you can see, is The Democracy Establishment, and I am going to try to make the case during my presentation that this field that I talk about call the democracy establishment, this group of people and organizations working to try to aid democracy in the developing world, that this, this field has had consequential impacts on the way international politics looks today. So that's what the presentation is about. So let me start out. This is a presentation, really, that's also about promoting democracy. And I wanted to begin with some examples of the phenomenon that I'm talking about. So here's just a few programs that I pulled off the internet recently from one of the international institutions that's involved in democracy promotion. The UN has a democracy fund okay, that supports foreign aid programs in the developing world with an eye towards supporting democracy there. So for example, recently the UN has been trying to strengthen the Albanian media uh, recognizing that the media is a key underpinning to the good governance and accountability required for democratic development. The Democracy Fund has also been increasing or trying to increase women's political participation and civil participation in civil society and to advance leadership opportunities for women in government and civil society organizations in Azerbaijan, in this example. Um, and just to give you a third example, the UN Democracy Fund uh, supported a program enabling Lebanese youth to express their ideas and influence public debate and the program also sought to train them in democratic practice, leadership, negotiation, and conflict resolution. 
So one of the things that I think is interesting about all of these programs is sort of like why are these programs, why do we call them democracy promotion? Um, how, do, how do they fit into this rubric? So let me start off with some definitions and try to make clear what I talk about when I say democracy promotion or democracy assistance. Okay, so democracy promotion this is any attempt that a state makes or a group of states make that is trying to encourage countries to democratize, whether to support countries' democratic transitions or countries' democratic consolidation. Now, democracy promotion takes a lot of different forms, okay? So uh, democracy promotion can involve diplomatic pressure on countries. It can involve economic sanctions or rewards, so carrots or sticks trying to get countries to democratize. Democracy promotion also sometimes involves conditions that are put on joining the membership of international organizations. So there's all sorts of different tools that countries use as they try to promote democracy in developing countries. And another tool is what we call democracy assistance, okay? And democracy assistance, and that's what the programs sponsored by the UN Democracy Fund fall into. This is a type of democracy promotion in which whoever is giving the aid program says, we are doing this to promote democracy. If, if, if they say we are doing this to promote democracy, then we count it as democracy aid. And if they don't, then it doesn't count as democracy aid. That's kind of what I'm talking about here. And so UN Democracy Fund says that they're trying to promote democracy by sponsoring these aid programs. So we're going to count that as democracy assistance. And the goal of this project is to understand why do the projects go the places they do? Why do they take the forms that they do? How have the types of programs changed over time? And um, if I haven't already said it already, let me hit my last bullet point here, which is that democracy assistance, it can be given by international organizations, like the UN Democracy Fund. That's an agency of the UN. But more often, democracy assistance is given by states acting alone to support some program in another state. So democracy assistance, as the introduction already has highlighted, democracy assistance is a relatively new phenomenon. Democracy promotion is something that has been going on longer. But democracy assistance, so foreign aid that's trying to promote explicitly democracy in the developing world, is something that really started in the 80s. Okay, And in this graph that I brought with me today here, you can see in the solid line the amount of money that's being spent per year um, in constant dollars by the US which is the largest donor in dollar terms uh, in, ter in giving democracy assistance, then you can see uh, in the dotted line the money that's being spent by all countries together. So this is something, this is a phenomenon that's really grown over time. Uh, no sign of stopping, really. So we want to understand it. Now, the title of the book that I'm presenting on today is The Taming of Democracy Assistance. And this is a phenomenon that has been happening alongside the growth of democracy assistance. Okay, So not only is democracy assistance changing in the amount of money that states and international organizations are spending on it, but what these programs are doing is changing. Okay, So you can see in the solid line here, I'm just looking at US government spending, and I'll talk about why in a bit. You can see in the solid line the proportion of US aid that has been going to support dissidents. Okay, So it, when democracy assistance began in the 80s, support for dissidents was about half of what US government spending was going towards under the rubric of democracy promotion. And the proportion has really decreased over time. Now it's a smaller amount of the aid. Um, and in fact, the amount of aid has dropped not just in relative terms, but in dollar terms. Uh, the amount that's going to distance has changed as well. Um, in contrast, we see just as an example, other types of aid have become much more prominent over time. When democracy assistance began in the 1980s, the US government spent virtually nothing on the promotion of good governance, whereas now they spend about as much on good governance as they do to support dissidents in the developing world. Okay, And I could also show you several other types of aid that I'll talk about, like support for women's political participation, for example that has also really been increasing over time. It's not something that really existed in the 80s, and now it's an important component of international aid.
so the phenomenon, just to sort of put the previous graph in, in words here, OK, to summarize the point, the puzzle of the book is that in the 1980s, democracy assistance frequently challenged autocrats kind of head on. OK, it supported dissident groups in the developing world. It supported political parties. It supported trade unions. This was what most of the efforts went towards, um, whereas today, Aid very frequently supports programs like efforts to support good governance or efforts to support women's political participation that are tamer, that don't directly confront dictators. Um, and I want to know, why has this happened? Okay, Why has democracy assistance become less confrontational over time? And why also has it become really interested in uh, sort of getting measurable outcomes finding programs that can be associated with some sort of quantitative output uh, that can be shown to increase. So I think that there's a few kind of conventional explanations that would make sense to ex answer this question about why democracy assistance has been tamed. And all of these explanations have something to them. They're not wrong. Uh, but they, I'm going to say that they don't tell the whole story, OK? So the first common explanation is to say, well, you know, a lot in the world is different than it was in the 1980s. The countries that are the targets of assistance have changed, OK? Um, maybe the aid that was appropriate in the 1980s during an era um, of the Cold War doesn't make sense anymore. That explains what's going on. Um, another possibility is that donor government's preferences have changed. Okay, So what the US government wants when it's promoting democracy is different today than it was in the 1980s. Um, and then finally, a possible explanation for this change over time is that you know we just know what we're doing better today than we did in the 1980s. We've learned how to design effective programs. Support for dissidents doesn't work so well. Support for political parties doesn't work so well, whereas support for local governance is a really good thing. OK, that's another possibility. But I think these kinds of explanations don't get us all the way towards a convincing explanation of the phenomenon. Um, and I'll try to, over the course of my presentation, show you some of the ways where the co conventional wisdom uh, is powerful, but then also some of its limitations. But I think some of the questions that these common explanations don't help us answer is for example, if it's just that donors' preferences are for TAME programs, well, there are some countries, I can give you some examples of these, where it really seems like, from everything they say, the donor governments really do want democratization. They would really like to see regime change, even. And yet, the programs often take a very TAME approach in those countries, OK? Um, also, there's not a the evidence, I would say, uh, on the record of democracy assistance is quite mixed. Um, some people who have done studies on the efficacy of promoting democracy suggest that it can have a positive effect on average. But other people say, no, no, um, it doesn't, you know, and can provide lots of cases of lack of efficacy. It sort of depends on what data you use and what kind of methods you use and so on. Okay, But I, I would say the, the best evidence does not present a picture of really efficacious democracy assistance efforts. Um, and so then again, that sort of doesn't seem consistent with the idea that, well, you know, we've really learned how to do this over time. Um, I think the picture would be m more positive if, if that were going on. Um, and finally, I didn't put this on my slide, but I could have done, is that even in countries that have experienced no democratic transition, no major change in their form of government over the last 20 or 30 years, we still, even if we just look within those countries, we see a big change in the way democracy is being promoted. So I think, again, it can't only be that the target states have changed. So, OK. So I say this isn't a full explanation, so what, what might be get us towards a fuller explanation. Well, in a nutshell, my argument is that tamer types of democracy assistance programs can help the organizations that play a really crucial role in the design and implementation of democracy assistance away from Washington, DC, or Brussels, or wherever these programs are being funded. Um, these organizations that design and implement programs survive and thrive when they pursue tame programs. Um, and as these organizations have professionalized and activism for democracy has become 
institutionalized and bureaucratized, organizations have converged increasingly on the programs that help them survive and thrive as organizations. Okay, so that's kind of the overview of the argument, but I'll try to flesh it out in more detail. So one of the, I think, important things that you have to understand when it comes to uh, appreciating the dynamics that are involved in how democracy assistance is designed and implemented is how it is exactly that programs get funded. Okay, this is an important aspect of my argument. So I have here an example, a little schematic of the way a program, in this case in Jordan, which is a country that I focus on in my book, how, how does a program that gets implemented in Jordan, how, how did it get funded? Okay, so it starts, it, it's a long chain of getting to that Jordanian NGO that ultimately implements the program. And it starts with Congress, uh, which will authorize funding to support democracy assistance in the developing world. Although we could even take it back a step further because on it's not like uh, Congress is acting totally on its own, right? Because people in Congress also have to answer to the US public, even if Americans aren't always that attentive on foreign policy issues. So Congress is authorizing funding for democracy assistance. Um, but it's not like Congress just says, OK, Jordanian NGO, we want to help you support democracy. Here's some money. No, it goes through several layers of delegation uh, before it gets to that non-governmental organization in Jordan. So one of the three main institutions in the US that su supports and funds democracy assistance activities Activities is the National Endowment for Democracy, or NED, okay? So this is a foundation that's based in Washington, D.C. That's reason for being is to support democracy assistance programs through grants in the developing world. Um, but the NED actually will often not just, it doesn't just give money to non-governmental organizations in the developing world, but will actually give money to American non-governmental organizations or NGOs for example, the Center for International Private Enterprise, which is an American NGO based in Washington, D.C. And then it's SIPE that will then say, OK, well, we would like to support a political dialogue process in Jordan. And it is SIPE that will select an Jordanian NGO, like the Al-Quds Center for Political Studies, um, that in the end, this is the group that designs and implements this activity in Amman, Jordan. So it's really. How, how do we understand what the non-governmental organization like the Al-Qud Center for Political Studies, one of the things that my project is really interested in is trying to understand what the preferences of this NGO are and how they interact with all of the organizations and also the government that is ultimately funding its activities overseas. Um, from the United States in this case, but also how the Al, the Al Quds Center interacts with the Jordanian government, uh, which it also has to really pay attention to because it's doing its work in Jordan and it needs to stay on the right side of the law. Uh, Jordan is a, not a democracy. Um, it's a monarchy, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And so the Al-Quds Center really has to pay attention to both sides. On the one side, who's funding it, and the donor relationships that it has, and on the other side, its host, the Jordanian government, okay? So just to try to delineate the preferences of the, the different people and organizations involved in democracy assistance, um, I want to think through both what the government officials might want um, and then also what the non-governmental organizations like the Al-Qud Center, but also like the Center for International Private Enterprise on the previous slide, what they want, okay? So government officials, people in the US that are funding democracy assistance, well, what do they want? Well, um, they want democracy, okay? Okay, that is um, maybe a controversial thing to say, um, and it's certainly not the case that the U.S. government, for example, wants democracy at all, you know, no matter what, in every country, um, spare no expense. No, that, that is not the case. Um, nevertheless, the U.S. government and other Western governments have had a long-standing commitment to promote democracy, and that's that's why they fund assistance programs, I think. Um, we, we'll have to take their word, take them at their word a little bit there, okay? So so they, they fund democracy assistance because they think that the world would be a better, safer place if more countries were democracies. But at the same time, 
And here, Jordan is a good example, I think, in countries that are of strategic importance to government officials. So Jordan is a very staunch ally of the United States in the Middle East, um, in part because of its peace treaty with Israel, but also for other reasons, including in the war on terror. Um, in countries that are friends of government officials, allies, that are not democracies, government officials will want aid to take a tamer approach, okay? They will like aid that is less confrontational because it's not a very good idea to maintain positive relationships with, say, the Jordanian government if you're funding dissidents to go run around and stir up trouble, okay? That, that's not a good recipe. Um, and then finally, so government officials sometimes have a preference for non-confrontational aid. Then at other times, and this is basically since about the mid-90s, government officials have become increasingly concerned about results when it comes to foreign assistance, okay? So government officials would like to see foreign aid programs that they can say to for example, the US public, OK, these programs, they are making progress. See, look, their Freedom House, this country's Freedom House score improved. This is a rating of democracy. Or this country has a larger number of women in parliament. And we've been giving it aid to support women's political participation. So, so government officials would really like to see some sort of results that they can show to the public. You know, this, this is a worthwhile endeavor. So that's what I would say in a nutshell generally Western governments that are supporting democracy assistance, what they prefer. Now, what about non-governmental organizations? So I would say they want two things. So first, again, bottom line, especially if you are a non-governmental organization that is working in a hostile environment that's not a democracy, if you're putting your life on the line even sometimes to support human rights and democracy. Why do you do it? Well, it's because you, you would like your country to democratize, okay? So fundamentally, this is the moral principle that motivates what the NGOs are doing. But they also have to worry not just about democratization, but they need to worry about their survival as organizations. And now, this can have a sort of pragmatic component as well as a more principled one. The principled one is that, of course, the organization cannot push successfully for democratization if it no longer exists. So it needs to make sure that it still has funding and that it's still um, on the right side of the law, et cetera. But it also has a more pragmatic element, OK? So organizations, uh, especially as they grow older, you know, people want to have uh, a retirement fund, their employees maybe, or you know, they want to be able to provide health insurance, whatever. The organization needs to watch how it's doing as an organization. Um, and so this is also an important component. And I see there's a software update, so I'm just going to ignore that and hope that doesn't come back. Um, the survival takes two, survival concern takes two, sort of two, it happens on two fronts, let's say, okay? So um, to survive, the, an NGO like the Al Quds Center, first it needs to make sure that it's still getting funding, okay? So survival, on the one hand, you need to look to your donors. Um, that's one aspect of survival. But survival also means that you have to look to the government of the country where you're working, okay? So it also involves uh, staying on the right side of, of your host, okay? So survival has these sort of two components. And the argument that I advance in the book, and this is goes back to this idea of tame, taming of democracy assistance, is that tame programs are good for helping organizations survive. If you pursue tamer programs, that, that's a kind of savvy strategy to do. Okay, so this is, I have here is a picture from a women's political participation program sponsored by a prominent American NGO in the democracy establishment, okay, this is, which is the National Democratic Institute, or NDI. Um, this is a program that was in Nepal. 
And I would say that a program supporting women's political participation, it's sort of a relatively tame form of democracy assistance because it satisfies two criteria, okay? It's a program that is what I would call measurable, and it's a program that I would call regime compatible, okay? So by a measurable program, I'm thinking here of activities that are tend to be associated with some sort of quantitative outputs um, or outcomes, really, um, because these are the types of programs that help organizations impress donor officials because they can say, you know, with this example, look, here's the number of women in parliament, so our program really made a difference. Now, saying that there's a larger number of women in parliament, that's certainly a different thing than making a claim about the sort of causal effect of the program, but it's kind of a plausible thing that organizations can show, um, better than nothing, certainly, to say, look, we're part of a positive trend in a country. And then when I say regime compatible program, um, I'm thinking here of a program that doesn't seem to threaten the imminent survival of whoever is in charge of the incumbent government where the program is taking place, okay? So um, whereas the measurable programs help organizations impress donor officials, Regime compatible programs help organizations maintain access in the countries where they work, okay? Um, access would include uh, visas, for example, if it's an American NGO working in Nepal. Okay, so whereas this image here is meant to give you an example of what a relatively tame program might look like, here is a an image from a program sponsored by another American NGO, which is the International Republican Institute, that it was part of a political party training activity. This is a kind of harder uh, program to have a measurable out output for outcome, excuse me, outcome, not output. And it's also a much more confrontational program, I would say. So this um, program is taking place in Jordan. Um, you know, if the, the political party program works, well, we don't have a cross-national index of political parties. It's, it would be hard to know, short of an election that was imminent where a political party did really well after receiving the training. It's a bit harder to show what that measurable outcome might be at the level of the country of a program. And political party activities often tend to be very confrontational towards the government, okay? So, if, if, I mean, if it's a monarchy, if you are strengthening political parties, this is this is a potentially dangerous proposition. Okay, so harder for the NGO to do that kind of program in such a way that will impress the donors. Also harder to do this kind of program in such a way that it will continue that the NGO will continue to maintain access. So basically, this argument about how tame programs serve as a smart strategy for organizations in the democracy establishment, it produces several observable implications. In other words, things that should be true if the argument is true, okay? So the first is, um, and I haven't spoken about this too much, but fundamentally, if organizations want to survive and they want to impress donor governments, we would expect, because they need to get funding, we would expect that if donor governments want tame programs, that the organizations will provide them, okay? So if the donor government is thinking, you know, this country where you're working, this is one of our allies, please don't agitate too much there. Organizations should accommodate that preference, okay? Um, it only makes sense to do so. Um, second, for the argument to be true, we would expect that uh, the rewards that organizations gain from team programs, that they at least sometimes come at a cost in terms to, of effective democratization, okay? So if the argument isn't just that organizations are doing whatever it is that donor governments want, but that they're kind of thinking strategically and thinking, well, you know, the donor government can't see exactly what we're doing. It's hard to keep track of all of these programs that they're funding overseas. So let's smartly, savvily choose the program that will help us survive. I think that's going to be a women's political participation program, not a political party program. This argument rests on an assumption that there are at least some costs to tame programs. Otherwise, donors would just demand them everywhere. Um, and then finally, the argument implies that when, if donors, if this isn't what donors just want across the board, then 
then the argument implies that when donors find it harder to observe and control what organizations in the democracy establishment are doing, then the organizations should pursue tame programs more because those are the programs that serve the interests of the organizations. And when the organizations are given more freedom, we would expect them to choose the kinds of activities that are in their survival interests. Whereas if donors are really keeping a close watch on what the organizations are doing and trying to control whatever the organizations do, the organizations should not just be as focused on their own survival, but focused more on the kinds of activities that would uh, uh, please donors, OK? So this is the first part of my argument um, and some of its observable implications. But there's a second part too, okay, which really brings into play the temporal dynamic that I tried to illustrate for you with the graph that I showed before, okay, which is that professionalization within the democracy establishment, I argue that this causes organizations to converge on tamer programs, okay? So when democracy assistance began in the 1980s, there was a collection of small organizations that were involved in the activity, okay? In many cases, these were very young organizations, just a few people working on them, maybe out of somebody's apartment even, okay? Um, but over time, this becomes more of an industry. Um, as happens when there's more resources flowing into the endeavor and uh, more people working in it. And that's when we have, instead of just this collection of people and organizations that are working in the area, we have emerging more of a professional field, okay? And this is when we see the democracy establishment, as I call it, starting to emerge. Once this democracy establishment starts to emerge, there's two really important dynamics that, that come up. So one is that the organizations in the field have to start worry, uh, worrying about competing with each other, okay? So development organizations start to notice, well, you know, there's a lot of money to be had in democracy assistance. Maybe we should expand into that area. Um, and it becomes harder to get grants. You know, initially there may have just been a few organizations working in this area, but now there's hundreds, okay? And because of this growing funding competition, I would expect organizations to become more focused on their survival and more intent on pursuing the types of programs that will achieve that. In other words, I would expect that when competition for funding is stronger, as well as competition for other resources, I should say, I would expect organizations to converge on tamer activities. Um, at the same time, and also partially as a consequence of competition, uh, there's this sort of professionalism that starts to replace activism within the organizations that are involved in this endeavor. Um, and as the organizations become more professional, I expect them to care more about maintaining themselves as organizations, care more about their survival, and to view TAME programs as appropriate. And as the field professionalizes, it's also the case that we now have lots of master's programs that you can complete uh, to learn how to become a democracy assistance practitioner, for example. And these kinds of institutions reinforce ideas about how to promote democracy appropriately, okay? Um, so like the first part of my argument, this part of the argument suggests a number of observable implications too, okay? so. Um, for example, I expect that uh, there will be competition that increases in the field over time, that there will be professional norms that increase over time. I expect that when competition is stronger, that there will be more team programs. And I expect that when the organizations become more professional, they will also perform prefer tamer programs. So this is kind of an overview of the argument. And now what I'm going to do is sort of blitz through and give you some of the highlights and snapshots of some of the evidence in the other chapters in the book. Okay, so the book has nine chapters. I've just tried to go over the first two chapters. Um, and then I'm going to blitz through, through, through the rest and then conclude with some implications for policy in practice. Okay, so in the third chapter, this is about tame democracy assistance, what it is and why it matters. So in this chapter, I try to make the case that we don't really know what kind, how to promote democracy. That is something that is really hard to do, hard to know how to 
what, what to define as democracy, hard to know how to measure success. Um, and, and there's really no consensus. And there's certainly no consensus that TAME programs are the way to go across the board. Th th this is not the case. Um, just to give you an illustrative quote, OK, one donor official says, um, Progress will come over the long term. It's not always visible. Okay. In other words, you know, we, we, it's really hard to know what will work and and why. Um, that being said, I do show in the chapter that there is a correlation between tame democracy assistance and democracy. Uh, 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 excuse me. There, I should say like there's a negative correlation <laughs> between tame d democracy assistance and democratization. Okay. So so many of the times that we see democracy assistance having its most positive effects, whether it's in Slovakia in the 1990s or cases where democracy assistance really seems not to have worked well with Middle East um, more recently. We do see this pattern where the team assistance is really there in droves in some of the the difficult cases, whereas it's prominent and it's not that we have the untamed version of democracy assistance in cases of successful democratic transition. Now, please don't leave here today and tell everybody, you know, Sarah Bush told me that tame democracy assistance is a failure um, and that, that it, it, it always is a bad thing for democracy. That's not the case I'm trying to make here. The case I'm trying to make is that we just don't know. Um, in the absence of any kind of quality information about what works and what doesn't work and some suggestive evidence that, that that team democracy assistance can be a negative thing, um, we're moving towards it. Okay, so it's not, I'm not making the case that this is, the empirical record shows clearly that this is a bad thing. Um, it, there's a lot of complicated questions that we would need to answer, both normative and um, in terms of research design, but it, it I, I do want to make the case that we don't know that it works. Um, and moreover, I want to emphasize that it's not the case that government officials say, oh, we just wish that we would have these really tame programs everywhere, OK? So when I have presented my research to people in DC um, on the Hill, when I've presented my research in the field to um, government officials that are working abroad um, and in the design of aid programs, they always say, okay, can you tell us all of these team programs what they are because we don't want to fund them next time. Okay, so this, this, isn't, this isn't something that, that everybody is embracing on the donor official side of things, which is why I think it's such a puzzle that we see more and more of it. If we don't know that it works well and government officials at least seem to think it's not a good thing. OK, then the next two chapters in the book look at sort of high, macro level correlations between tame, tame reforms of democracy assistance and, and different indicators that I have that I think help test the argument that, that I've shown to you already. OK, so um, in chapter four, for example, and I think I need to be speeding up, um, in chapter four, I test the, I'll just skip ahead here, actually. Chapter four, I look um, at more than 12,000 programs that have been funded by uh, developed countries that are members of the OECD, which is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and the key institution that countries have to report their foreign aid spending to. I look at thousands of these programs that have been funded by more than 20 um, donors, OK? And I do analyses uh, that help me control for factors like what is the level of democracy in the target state? Wh who is the donor country? What region is the target state from? Some of these really important factors that we would think or maybe hope would influence the design of democracy assistance programs. And I find that there are really interesting um, patterns here that correlate uh, between the, the, the factors in my argument um, and that I expect to, to influence TAME programs and, and what we see in the record. So for example, I would say that I would expect donor governments to be more likely to like TAME programs in countries that are strategic allies of the donor. And we can identify such countries by their affinity with the donor country. For example, how closely this country votes with the donor in the United Nations General Assembly. Um, and what we can also do is try to 
find indicators of when donor governments are better able to observe and control organizations in the democracy establishment. And I go have a number of such indicators here. And I think just in the interest of time, I'm not going to get, get into them, but simply uh, tell you that the, some of these indicators which relate to the nationality of the NGO that the donor is funding and the um, type of uh, international organization that the donor might be working through, that they work in the expected ways. OK, let me move now to um, the chapter 5, where I document the taming phenomenon by looking at changes in American government grant making. Now, I look at changes in American government grant making because this is the type of aid for which the data are available over many years, which is what I need in order to perform the analysis. But I would say that, anecdotally, at least, I, I think that this phenomenon exists among other donors. So first what I do in this chapter is I look at the activities of this institution I mentioned before, the National Endowment for Democracy, which was created in 1983 and receives funding each year from the US government to promote democracy by supporting non-governmental organizations. And again, coding thousands of the NEDs Act programs each year, you can see here in the solid line the proportion of the organization's programs that are what I call measurable, and then the, in the dotted line the proportion of the organization's programs that I would call regime compatible. So combined here we see sort of the rise since 1985 and until 2009, the rise of the tamer forms of democracy assistance. Um, and again, trying to control for a number of other factors that could influence the design of programs. We see, for example, in a, relative, in an, a relatively competitive funding environment, which I determine by the number of NGOs that are competing for NED grants, 8 to 6 percent more tamer, um, according to the backgrounds and career histories of the individuals working in the democracy establishment. When more of these people come from a professional background, we see aid being 7% tamer, all else equal. And then when the country is a strong military ally of the United States, again, that is correlated with tamer programs. OK. So then let me move ahead to briefly talk about the next chapter, uh, Creating the Democracy Establishment, where I try to sketch out some of the characteristics of what this network looks like. OK, so gathering um, internet connections uh, for a number of organizations in the field, I'm looking to, at how much do organizations link to each other. OK, this is one way that we can try to identify social connections. And one of the things that's interesting, this is a graph that this produced of the network connections, is there's kind of a tight group of organizations that are clustered in the center. And then a lot of organizations that are spread out farther apart. So people would call this kind of network a hub and spoke network in which we have some organizations that are in the center that are really powerful, really connected to each other, and then organizations uh, you know, outside here that are less connected to each other and less connected to the organizations in the center. So the central organizations are basically donor organizations like the NED and American NGOs, um, whereas the spokes or the peripheral organizations tend to be NGOs local to the target country. Um, to try to understand some of the dynamics within this network, I, in this chapter, I looked at three organizations that are central to the field, um, including Freedom House, whose logo you have here, the Institute for Democracy in Eastern Europe, and the Open Society Institute, and try to chart how they changed over time to see if competition and professionalization really matter in the ways that I thought that they did. Um, in a nutshell, and I'll show you, give you a couple of quotes in a minute, um, Freedom House is an organization that has really professionalized, gone from being a really activist organization to a more professional one. And it's grown tremendously while it's done so. Whereas the Institute for Democracy in Eastern Europe, which 30 years ago didn't look so dissimilar from Freedom House, has not professionalized um, and has kind of withered away. Um, doesn't it still exist in name, but has very small staff, uh, very little in the way of grants. Um, and I also talk about George Soros' foundation, the Open Society Institute. Um, and then finally, I, to 
d um, understand some of the dynamics between professionals and non-professionals, I use data from a survey of more than 1,000 democracy assistance practitioners. So just to give you some sense of what the Freedom House organization looked like. So when democracy assistance began, Began, Freedom House was one of the relatively few organizations that competed for and won a lot of funding. Okay, so in the 1980s, for example, Freedom House was able to secure 34 grants from the NED. By the 2000s, Freedom House went down to 13. Um, part of the reason for I mean, this is a complicated uh, dynamic. I'm not really giving you uh, the full picture here, but part of the reason for why Freedom House found it more difficult over time to get a lot of these grants is that other NGOs, like for example the German Marshall Fund, started to encroach on its turf. Um, and so Freedom House found it more difficult to compete with other NGOs that were in the same space. Um, and alongside the competition that the organization faced, it also started to professionalize. So people who ruled the organization in its early days were activists, people who um, were came to the organization um, because they they cared about its mission. Of course, everyone who's working there now still cares about the mission, but they also come with a much uh, deeper engagement with government and uh, with graduate degrees and a more professional understanding of the democracy assistance enterprise. As the organization changed like this, um, it started to engage in different activities. So most of what it did in the 1980s with NED grants was support the activities of dissidents, okay? And this is not something that Freedom House is doing nowadays. Um, and according to my interviews with folks who work or have worked at Freedom House, they tell me that the TAMER programs, things like supporting women's political participation, this has helped the organization maintain access, especially in big, lucrative, important countries like Jordan and Russia, where Freedom House might find it difficult to work otherwise. OK, then finally, I have two uh, chapters in the book where I look at cases of democracy assistance in the Middle East where I did field research. Um, the first is Jordan, and the second is Tunisia. OK, so in Jordan, the Sort of summary, here you can see the King Abdullah of Jordan. In Jordan, um, the funding environment is very competitive. The NGO sector is very professional. Um, and the government isn't a democracy, OK? It's not free. Um, so because of that, I would expect the aid to be very tame, both for access reasons and for competition reasons, and because, as mentioned before, Jordan is uh, an ally of the United States. OK. So one thing that I expect, however, is that the ability of donors to observe and control organizations in the democracy establishment in Jordan will, variations in that ability will affect the types of programs we see. Um, so for example, Here's a quote from one donor that I spoke to who is uh, based in Amman, Jordan, okay, and has a very good ability to observe programs because he can just go to the offices of the NGOs he funds or goes to their activities and see what they turned out, how the programs have turned out. And he said, we know that everything that counts can't be counted. Um, so if we're working with rights for migrant workers in Jordan, we go talk to the people involved and ask, who established the help desk? Um, was it us or was it the grantee? OK. Um, and so I think this quote does a nice job of, of the idea that donors, it's, it's only when they can't get better information about what is happening that they resort sometimes to these things that can be counted. OK. To give you some other quotes that I thought were interesting, I'll provide you with um, two, two perspectives on women's political participation programs. Okay, So one comes from an American NGO that's working in Jordan that is giving out grants to local civil society organizations. And they had hoped they might got, get some proposals after the Arab Spring that were really tough um, but according to the, the person working there, we still just got the same old anodyne programs about women. And women have already been done in Jordan. Well, why are people making these proposals? Well, here's a perspective from a Jordanian NGO. So the head of the NGO is a refugee in Jordan and has a, a, you know, a, a difficult situation there. It's a fragile for, for him. 
He says, I know I don't want to talk about political rights in Jordan because of my delicate personal situation, even though I'd like to. So all I can do is women's issues rather than more political issues. Okay. Now turning to Tunisia. So Tunisia is a very different case. Um, it's a country, I'm looking at Tunisia after the Arab Spring, after the revolution. Um, here, because Tunisian civil society was very uh, new and blossoming after the revolution, it's not a com very competitive environment, although the competition is starting to increase. Uh, it's not a very professional democracy establishment, although that's changing too. And it is a country that is much freer than Jordan. So I would expect the activities there to not be very tame, depending on how much funding competition there is. The level of funding competition is changing. So there have been a lot of funding pledges, which is part of the reason why I wouldn't expect a lot of competition. But some of these funding pledges haven't actually materialized. And then there's this explosion of sort of alphabet soup of international NGOs, ABA, IRIS, IFAS, KAS, NDI, IRI, et cetera, and then also an explosion of Tunisian NGOs. And what's happening as this takes place, this explosion, um, well, according to one Tunisian NGO, we have a market for international funds. Um, and this makes it hard for her organization to secure funding. The international NGOs, they're bigger, they have better relationships with donors, and they can bid for the same funding. And I thought this is a nice um, example of some of the dynamics that are changing in Tunisia. So within the same NGO, um, I talked to two different people. Okay, So one person says, we only want to do one or two programs and do them really well. In a few years, there won't be so many grants in Tunisia, so we want to focus on our own vision. Um, and then her colleague says, in an ideal world, we would like to work with every ministry in every sector of the society. Okay, so this is sort of the changing, the changing perspective, um, what's happening as the NGOs professionalize. So to conclude, what are the key takeaways? Just to remind you, the bottom line is that I'm trying to make the case in the project that organizations and the democracy establishment have converged on tamer pro approaches to aiding democracy. This is because of competition and professionalization within the field that has focused organizations on what can help them survive. Um, and the organizations have also been responsive to changing preferences in donor countries. So I think that the takeaways are important um, because it suggests, for example, that um, to understand things like democracy promotion or promotion of human rights, we have to look beyond states, also look at the organizations that are involved. And then here on the bottom point, that NGOs and world politics, this is sort of an effort to demythologize them and not just treat them as um, purely idealistic organizations, although they are idealistic, but also as organizations that have to care about their self-interests. In terms of policy implications, I hope that the project will help people recognize that you know, democracy assistance programs are not all meant to um, create short or medium term changes in countries' levels of democracy. So it's not surprising or shouldn't surprise us if some of the democracy assistance programs don't have that kind of effect. Um, if that's undesirable to donors, which I think it is sometimes, um, then the delegation structure, these dynamics of observation and reform are where we should look. Um, but um, the final punchline is that you know, is this taming of democracy assistance a good or a bad thing? Well, it sort of comes down to questions about how much do we value promoting democracy versus other goals that we may also care about, um, security and stability among them. So with that, I conclude, and I look forward to your questions. Yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, OK, is it not true that uh, Maybe um, is, is it not true that, that democracy assistance uh, is frequently perceived uh, by the citizens of a country as not the, the attempt to empower them, but to structurally adjust the, their domestic economy so as, as to make uh, the, their living and their livelihood more precarious? Yeah. And, and what are your thoughts on this? That's a great question. So I think that there is often a backlash against 
these foreign assistance programs by the citizens who are meant to be, you know, in the eyes of the donor governments, they're trying to help these citizens. Well, citizens don't always want want that kind of help, um, and so I think that this a aspect of perception and backlash is huge. Um, it that um, yeah, well, it depends on the eye of the beholder, right? Um, so one of the things I guess I think is interesting about this is I w was involved in um, a, a survey in Jordan, for example, where we were asking people about their attitudes uh, about women's political participation. We told some people, but not other people in the survey, guess what, the US government is supporting these programs big time. And we thought that when we told people that, people would react in a very negative way because of the perception of meddling that I think you're getting at. And um, be also because Jordan is a country with some of the highest levels of anti-Americanism. Um, and you know, for obvious reasons, people are, are doubt the US's intentions in Jordan um, when it comes to supporting democracy and human rights. Um, but actually, to, to my great surprise and the surprise of my co-author, we found that actually when you told people this information about US involvement there, it didn't make people less likely to support the issue of women's political participation, and sometimes even had a positive impact. And so, I mean, I, I don't, I, I think that, that there is often a strong backlash that can occur, but sometimes it's not as strong as I anticipated it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So I think that, that partisan dynamics in the countries that are targets of the, the programs often kind of depends on do you support the government or not? Are you in this party or that party? And depending on where you stand on that, that political cleavage affects if you think you know we're trying to be structurally adjusted, um, this is insincere foreign meddling, or oh, this is actually going to be on my side of the political issue and help me. But I'd like to add, by the way, that we're, since we are recording, uh, I'd like to ask people to raise their hands and then I'll bring them the the microphone. And while I'm waiting to do that for the next thing, I'd like to pose a question. Great. Um, which is, it seems to me there's a there's a couple of dynamics here. Mm -hmm. um, one is. Uh, that in order to make a living in the democracy assistance business, you have to be let into the country. Right. Uh, okay, and that, that's a, a strong, um, if, well, if there's only a few of them, then they can, they can choose to only go to the countries where they can somehow get in and, or, or, or take some risks and so on. But, but when you're trying to maintain an organization, you have to keep a business going, right. you have to go into particular, you, you, have to, you have to get into a bunch of countries to maintain your organization. Sure. And so that's how competition would lead to um, trying to satisfy the sort of half customer of the, other, of, 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 of the target country. Uh, but the other one is the emphasis on measurables. Mm -hmm. And the emphasis on measurables requires that something happen fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Right, so if it's just democratized or not, then, <laughs> then you could have no measurable effect for 10 years and how do you keep getting your grants? Um, uh, but the, then the emphasis on measurables is also part of a, it's related to professionalization because it's part of mm -hmm. the ideology of management now. Right. And I was very struck by the fact that the U.S. figures, you, you say you find a change in 1994, mm -hmm. which is when Clinton has come in yes. and they're reinventing government. And around the world you have the new public management, which is all about measure, 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 measure. So could you comment on uh, the, the role of the ideology of measurement, uh, perhaps related to professionalization, because I would expect that if you go into a school, that if you come from a school of nonprofit management uh, or, 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 or some of the uh, other academic programs, you are learning that you should measure, and it becomes part of the values of your professionals. Yeah, I, I agree with that comment completely. So I, that's, and this ideology that you reference is precisely why I expected to find a change and a shift towards measurable programs in the 1990s. Uh, there are a couple of things that happened there, so it's hard to, happened then, so it's hard to know which one really matters. But for example, uh, the, the Government Results and Performance Act, and then also the NED came under a lot of scrutiny in Congress for a lack of results, um, among other things. And I think that's exactly what is driving this change because organizations in the democracy establishment have to be responsive to this change in government ideas and new public management um, philosophy. That being said, I also think it's not just that 
donor governments are changing their tune and organizations have to change. Otherwise, we would just sort of see a change in the mid-90s and then not a further acceleration of these tamer programs. The fact that it continues to accelerate, I think, reflects the kind of other dynamic that you highlight, which is that as you become more professional, you become more concerned about uh, results, demonstrating things in a credible way. Maybe you've gone to graduate school where you've learned something about having a more results-oriented approach to your programs. And so I think both of these trends are happening at the same time. Thank you. Um, I had a question relating to uh, this democracy promotion and how people outside see see this and I, I was working at the UN during the time of the Arab Spring mm -hmm. so I happened to meet quite a few civil society people and both and and both so you know from the stories they tell me and also from the <coughs> evaluations I've seen of the UN democracy fund projects one of the big objections is uh, it's Western values and priorities that seem to dictate you know, the kind of projects that are taken. So for instance, just to give you an example, Spain, the agency, the initiative I worked for was backed by Spain. Mm -hmm. So Spain wanted to go and teach all the Arabs about how Spain and the president, former president of Portugal was our big boss. So they wanted to teach the Arab civil societies about how the transition in Spain and Portugal it occurred from a military dictatorship to a democracy. But you know, for many of these people, uh, they would go for these events, of course, but they would just say, you know, this is not really that relevant for us. What would be more relevant is to see the transition or the of democracy that took place in South America or in places like Indonesia and, and Malaysia. So there is that, that uh, that Western values and interests is very uh, much a problem, I think. Uh, I think a second aspect that's uh, also important is that even though many of these things don't directly affect democracy, uh, I think many people don't necessarily want money. They'll gladly take the money, if they, but they really would like political support. And this is where they would really prefer projects that don't really do trainings and things like that, but really more about building links between civil societies, both in the West and outside the West. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, I was just going to share maybe an anecdote, which was that when I was in Tunisia, um, you know, there were a number of programs that were attempting to build these kinds of connections that you recommend, you know, take uh, maybe taking Tunisian NGOs and linking them up with NGOs in the Czech Republic because perhaps the transitions were similar. And at the same time, there were a number of programs there that were bringing in experts from, say, Afghanistan, where so many of the, the international community have been involved in electoral assistance, for example. And a lot of the Tunisian folk that I spoke to sort of said a similar thing. It's like, well, like we're nothing like Afghanistan. So why, why are you bringing us experts from Afghanistan? Uh, you know, th this, is this is almost even insulting that you would compare us to Afghanistan um, and bring us experts from there. So I think the cultural match um, and the political match is very important. I would love to hear more about your experiences. Thank you. I'd like to follow up on the last question, is basically whose definition of democracy? Mm -hmm. If you look at the Western definition of democracy, you get one thing. But with the death of, I believe it's Prime Minister Lee of Singapore, mm -hmm. how he basically set up an Eastern democracy, one party system, but he had to basically uh, eliminate all the different ethnic uh, clashes and everything, so it's a one-party state, and it is a democracy with restrictions. Uh, I'd like you to comment on, might that type of democracy be better in certain countries than the present uh, military or other type of uh, rulers? Thank you. Yes, so that's a good question. So, you know, just to put my own cards on the table, I, I think, 
that I would not, I don't really think I would consider Singapore to be a democracy. It may be many, it may be many good things, okay? Um, but democracy isn't one of them, right? Um, it, I think that there is a, can be a tendency, especially among leaders, you know, to sort of say, we are a democratic republic, right? Um, but it doesn't mean that it's a democratic government in a, in the way that I think most of us would think about it, even just fundamentally as ruled by the people, right? Um, so, so I, but I think that, that what the, I'm trying to do in the book sort of is to understand how things like good governance, for example, which I think is something that is also, it, it, it's good, um, but it's not the same thing as democracy. I think you know you can have a well-governed country that isn't a democracy. You can have a democracy that isn't well-governed, right? And I, I'm trying to understand how good governance gets brought into the implicit definition of democracy in these programs. Um, and you know, I would say that it has something to do with the incentives of the people involved, but uh, others might make other arguments. I'd just like to comment that. Uh, in terms of in terms of labels, that the old British TV show Yes Minister in one of the in one of the episodes, uh, there was this mysterious country, St George's Island or something. Anyway, they were going to set up a they, a, a democratic republic, which meant it was communist, right? Because if you're a people's democratic republic, anything called a people's democratic right. republic must be must be communist. <laughs> but okay. Yes. All right. You already touched upon this uh, in your presentation, but you've mentioned that. Um, countries that are considered geopolitical allies of the mm -hmm. United States are more likely to have tame programs. What I would like to know is what is it like in countries that are considered geopolitical rivals or even enemies of the United States? I mean, is there more of an aggressive democracy promotion agenda there or is it the opposite where we might not want to provoke them or maybe it's there is democracy promotion but it looks tame but it's more subtle in the way it promotes mm. uh, U.S. friendly democracy? Yeah, that's a great question. So it, in countries that are not geopolitical allies, including countries that are geopolitical enemies, as you put it, the aid does look different there than in countries like Jordan, let's say. Um, even in a country like Tunisia, let's say, although the US has strategic interests there, it's much less strong than in Jordan. Um, so in such countries, yes, you would see a less tame form of democracy assistance, certainly. Um, that being said, the, the same dynamics of competition and professionalization and observation and control, they remain at play, I would argue, everywhere. Um, so it's a question of, uh, for example, um, in Jordan, um, I, you know, the aid starts pretty tame and then it just gets tamer over time, okay? Whereas maybe in Tunisia, the aid starts out not very tame, but probably will also become tamer over time. So, so, so there's, a, there's a significant difference between the two countries, but the trends, I would expect them to be similar. Does that answer your question? Okay. So this, this isn't really a topic, uh, but, but I can't help following up. Wouldn't one expect that uh, the sources of democracy assistance would probably vary fairly systematically with the countries that receive it in, uh, in a couple of ways. One would be, I would expect Tunisia, for example, to get more from the EU and more from France compared to the United States. And you know, do you see those kinds of patterns? Yes. And, is there, and is there any effect from the sources in this way? Um, yes, yeah, so, so you definitely see that kind of pattern. And the, I would say that the Western countries that promote democracy, you know, UK versus US, et cetera, they're more similar than they are different. Um, they don't, some people will say that they engage in fundamentally different approaches to democracy assistance. The data I've examined don't suggest that that's the case, um, but it's not to say that there aren't some differences. You know, some European countries, for example, have done a lot to incorporate uh, gay rights into the democracy promotion agenda. That's not something that is really present in the US democracy promotion agenda the same way. So it's, there, there are differences. But I would say they're more similar than they are different. Uh, you've sort of assumed that we all know what democracy is. But it seems to me that, at least for the US, uh, democracy is too often conflated with free market enterprise, capitalism. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could comment on that. Yes, yeah. So I think you're right that that 
and not just in the US, but I think in the international community more generally, sort of support for political liberalization often goes alongside support for economic liberalization. And I think many people regard them as two sides of the same coin um, and something where one reinforces the other. Uh, so I think that's, that's certainly certainly the case. Um, and, and, and it is also the case that in these assistance programs that I've been studying, they will quite often support um, business um, and free markets as part of them. So one of the organizations I mentioned, for example, C Center for International Private Enterprise, well, you can guess from, from the name of the organization uh, w where it stands on this issue of whether free markets are part of, should be part of the deal. It's hard for me not to be cynical. So I'll be cynical. OK. Um, I see the process of uh, the evolution of demo democracy assistance very much like the process of the evolution of foreign aid, mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that it's become more professionalized, as you point out, away from the activist mode. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, just as importantly, it's become more captured by the two governments involved, or mm -hmm. the two fundamental agencies involved. I'm not talking about the NGOs. They're very serious about their work, and many of them are, are very uh, responsible in that regard. But for example, foreign aid, we thought, was designed to aid economic development. Well, where in the world has it happened? The places where it works is places where it bypasses the governments mm -hmm. involved. Aid to microenterprise, for example, where the distributor is a kid on a bicycle or a, or a motor scooter or something like that, distributing $40 here and $30 there to local villagers. Mm -hmm. Well, the governments don't control that, and they don't like that. So we got out of the business of aid to microenterprise. Uh, we'd rather give two million dollars for a project that isn't going to work, but we can control, then giving 50 or 60 dollars here and there to projects we can't control. And I think that that's what's happened with democracy assistance. I would like somebody, you in particular, to explain to me why in the world a non-democratic government would do anything to facilitate the furtherance of democracy in that country. What's in it for them? Yeah, so those are great questions. And I agree with you about the similarities between foreign assistance and democracy assistance. I think that I have, I have a lot that I could say in response. Uh, let me see if I can keep it brief. So one thing is on the question of why a non-democratic government would allow this, well, sometimes it's hard to prevent. Um, and governments that are non-democratic have gotten a lot savvier about restricting the foreign funding laws of NGOs in their countries and have, especially Russia has been a leader in this kind of movement. Uh, you know, countries have gotten better at trying to prevent things that might be destabilizing within their borders. But it, it, it can sometimes be difficult to to control, basically, right? Um, and so, so, so activities can get funded and supported. Even in Tunisia before the revolution, there were some very quietly supported activities that would go on in the country. You know, was that something that the government of Tunisia would have wanted? Certainly not. Um, but it, 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 you know, it's hard to keep track of everybody within your borders, right, and everything that's happening. So, so I, well, part of it is that sometimes they can't stop it, although they're getting better at stopping it. I, at the same time, I would say, in a country like Jordan, and Jordan isn't unique in this way, if a country is extremely dependent on foreign aid for its survival, you have to allow some, you know, you, you allow the military aid in, you allow the economic aid in, you may end up allowing some of the democracy aid in too, right? So, so just trying to strengthen relationships I think so, yes, yeah. Um, and usually in a country that is receiving a tremendous amount of foreign assistance and military assistance and economic assistance, you know, democracy assistance would just be a very small proportion. So, you know, you say weighing the pros and the cons, uh, 
this is worth it. That's the calculation that they would make. But, but like I say, governments are increasingly thinking this stuff is dangerous, especially after the colored revolutions. Uh, for example, there was a lot of democracy assistance that was provided to those countries. And even in some of the Arab Spring countries, people saw there was a role for the international community. So you know, people, autocrats get worried, right? And so they're being more apt to clamp down on these kinds of programs. Well, and not just autocrats. We should, maybe I shouldn't say this, but we should remember that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was arguing that, uh, that there was democracy assistance for Arab voting by international left-wing NGOs, right? Um, and he's not an autocrat, but he's certainly the leader of a government who, who felt threatened and was able to use that uh, to, to as, as part of his internal politics in a place that by some definitions, not by others, is, 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 a, is sure, a democracy. Sure, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think that goes back to some of the questions that were raised before about the imposition of foreign values. I mean, even in a country that's sincerely democratizing and actually would really like international aid in a number of ways, you know, because it will help them on the transition, um, sometimes in such a situation, it can look bad politically. Um, the, if you followed the, the controversies in Egypt, for example, after the revolution there, you know, before the, the, the current government got in power, you know, there was a huge uh, uh, backlash against international funding for Egyptian NGOs. And that was really played to a domestic audience by the, the, the woman who was leading this campaign, you know, like, Let's you know it's a it sounds really good. Let's get those foreigners out. Kind of language. I was wondering if you could uh, perhaps make a final comment uh, in the context of this broader question of foreign aid, uh, which is the you, the amount of money for democracy assistance seems to have been have to, seems to have risen over a period of time fairly quickly, uh, till sort of leveling off. It looks like it. So one question is: It looks like it rose more quickly than foreign aid. The, the net foreign aid, and I'm wondering if that's true, and if that's true, why that would be, what that would say about the, the, the internal national dynamics. Uh, so that's one question. And then I guess the other thing that's puzzling me is when this stuff began, in some sense, uh, which in some sense is the creation of the NED, and uh, sort of coming out of Jimmy Carter, but trying to find a bipartisan way. Uh, so you've got a Republican Institute and a Democratic Institute, right? Um, when this, this stuff began uh, in the United States, it was related to the fact that there were some countries that United States policy, there were well, divisions in the United States, right? Because there were people who wanted to do it for in Eastern Europe, and there were people who wanted to do it in, in, in Central America, and there, 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 there were these divisions, but there was, My, my guess is that, that there, there were targets and there was a, a broader foreign policy part to it, okay? Mm -hmm. And it was part of a broader foreign policy debate within the United States, okay? And I guess my question is, as it becomes an EU thing and a UN thing and so on, what is the broader politics in which it is placed? Uh, is this, does this become something that's sort of more routine uh, rather than targeted at particular countries? Uh, does, does, does the nature of the political situation of democracy assistance change over the 30 years? Yes, okay, so the first question, yes, as a proportion of foreign assistance given by the US, democracy assistance has risen. I, I want to say that it was something less than 10% um, in 1990 of the U.S. Agency for International Development's budget and then getting close to 20% 13, 13 years later in 2003. So it has increased as a proportion. And then to your second question, yes, it has become routine. I think that's part of the this professionalization process I'm talking about in the book. So uh, the sort of, I think he's been called the Dean of Democracy Assistance Studies, is a fellow named Thomas Carruthers, uh, who works at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And he refers to democracy assistance as the sort of day in and day out democracy promotion tool. You know, it's something that goes on quietly, often under the radar in more than 100 countries around the world. So it's just a regular part of foreign assistance now. It's not the political enterprise that it once was. <laughs>
I would like to especially thank the audience for posing a wide range of questions that, uh, that, that opened up lots of things to consider. Uh, and, uh, and I would like to particularly thank Professor Sarah Bush for uh, responding to this wide range of questions <laughs> in a way that, that built off of a really fine, clear talk to, to take us even further in the understanding of this particular aspect of either democratization or foreign aid, however you would like to look at the question. Thank you very, Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you so much.